All right, here we are, and this is Gabe with Exponential Growth, episode number six. And today we're thrilled to have Pete Bosch from Horizon Wealth Management. Thank you, Pete, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, here uh, we're at the uh, home office at Pete House, and today we're going to be talking about personal growth, business growth. And before we jump into talking about business, Pete, I want to take some time. And a couple months ago, we met here at your house. And you show us this, and I was blown away not only by the content, but the intention that you have. So, of course, you're a successful leader in business, but now, you know, when you open the doors for a young entrepreneur's group, and that's how I met you, you share bits of wisdom for your journey that you put together this book. It's called No Manure, No Milk for Your Daughter. And then you share that with us, and that to me was like, wow, this is something. <laughs> so tell us about that. How do you uh, got the idea on putting this into paper? And Well, you know, uh, this is when my oldest daughter, Shelby, turned 18. That's one of those, uh, I guess, milestone birthdays for someone. And, uh, and of course, she was graduating high school or may, I think she had graduated high school a couple of weeks before she turned 18. She'd finished up. And it was just one of those moments where it hit me that, wow, she's getting ready to leave the nest and go off to college. And I've spent 18 years of modeling and developing and teaching and talking to and all these other things, but here she is going into this next chapter where she's going to be on her own and be around different sets of influences, different people and all that. And I just felt like I'm going to send her out with maybe just either some of which she had already heard, but just some reminders and some little bits of wisdom that that I had gotten along the way or that I wanted her to take with her. And I really started kind of writing it down in, in a handwritten form. And I was just like, I'm going to write her a letter. And then what came out of that was this idea of, I'm going to make it into a little booklet and maybe make it something more permanent that a, a letter may get filed away in a shoebox or may get thrown away or whatever. But if I make it into a little booklet, she might hold on to it and she might treasure it a little bit differently than just a letter. And it turns out that that's true. I mean, she still has this original thing that I sent her and uh, we talk about it from time to time. And it's not like she pulls it out and reads it all the time, but it's in her little memento stack that, you know, will never go away. So really that was it. It was the no manure, no milk is one of the lessons, you know, that I went in there and there's probably 10 or 12 of them in there, but I decided to name it that and then open up the actual booklet with that particular thing and what you'll see in there is it's a it's a combination of just motivational things uh spiritual messages just philosophies on life and how to succeed and things like that so it's sort of this hodgepodge of pete bush that i put in there and it was again really really well received and then of course i've shared it with a lot of people because i think it embodies a lot of my thought yeah, there's uh there's no sure things as as a free launch, it says effort produces results, so does lack of effort. Yeah, and I've said that to the kids all the way along. I mean, that's that's the another way of saying that is you get out of something what you put into it. And if you don't put much into it, most of the time you don't get much out of it. And so you're going to get results one way or the other. Whether you get the results you want or not depends on what you put into it. And the whole, I guess, the no manure, no milk piece of it is I open up with this with this Bible verse, Proverbs 14.4. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. And that's basically saying, in layman's terms, right, you can keep from shoveling manure by not having cows, but you won't have any milk to drink either. No manure, no milk. And so it's your choice. It's like, how much are you willing to pay? What price are you willing to pay to get the milk? You might have to shovel some manure to get it. <laughs> and and a lot of times that's worth it. And I think the milk can, it's an analogy for many different things in life. It can be, you know... <laughs> Like the five M's that we're talking about, it can be money, it can be, it can be, you know, your dreams come true, coming true. Uh, but what else do you think will be that milk in life? Well, it could be career goals. It could be family, uh, you know, what kind of family you want to have. It could be uh, any, your reputation. You know, it could be anything that you can dream up in your mind is the milk, right? I want to be thought of as a community leader. Okay, well, you got to pay a price for that. You have to get out there and get your hands dirty and roll up your sleeves and volunteer for stuff and spend time and invest money. And you could literally, that milk could be whatever it is that you desire. And the manure is the price you got to pay. <laughs> and, and it's different depending on whatever it is you want. So I, I thought that was... A good one to open up that little booklet with because at the end of the day a lot of things are going to come back to that it's like what do you want decide what what is the milk and then 
that's going to have a certain price to pay. You're going to have, probably have to find out what it's going to pay. And some of it you're going to be able to see up front that I need to pay this price. And some of it is going to be unexpected. And that comes up a little bit later, right? It's like, hey, you got to pay the price and keep moving. Yeah, and I see the first page where you kind of like have a special introduction letter for her. You talk about like eventually you will write your own book. But in, in reality, you're talking more about not necessarily it could be that she's going to write a book, but you're talking about her life. Correct. Right? And then you're talking about discovery. What do you want out of life? But do you think at 18 years old, you know, she had some ideas, but like you say, there is at 18 years old, you probably wouldn't think about where you are right now. I mean, you, you wanted to achieve great things and have milk. <laughs> yeah. Right, but um, right. what about discovery and at that early stage in life? Yeah. I mean, the milk I wanted when I was 18 was to play in the major leagues, play baseball. And then you do get these chances to kind of redream your future with your new set of circumstances, right? So, at 18, you only have a limited view of the world. You have a limited understanding of your unique abilities and your capabilities. And a lot of them haven't been fully developed yet. And sometimes it takes getting out and getting feedback on what you're good at and what you're not good at and where your passions lie and what you like before you you can envision something like what I'm sitting in today in my business and my life, my personal life and all that. It's like you can't see that when you're 18. All you can really see is more broad brushed things like, man, I want to make a good living. I want to have a good business. I want to have an awesome family. I want to be a good community guy. Those things appeal to me. I don't have any idea how to do that. Like I just know in general, that's what I, I want to do. And so you start pulling yourself towards it. And each stage you get to, whether it's opportunity or whether it's the right people show up in your life or whether it's the financial resources are uh, available, is you get the chance to redream and recast that future. And I mean, here I am at 49 and you could say, if I fast forward 25, 30 years from now, I would probably look back at 49 and go, man, I was selling myself short. I had no idea when here I am at 75, 80, and now this is my life. And it's because I will have gone through many more iterations of redreaming. Wow, that's powerful right there. And I know uh, Todd Barlow, episode number two, if you guys want to listen back to that, we talk about unique ability, strategic coach, and we will talk about that. So that's one part, like you say, and this applies for entrepreneurs, early stage entrepreneurs. They're starting out a business and they think that's what they're going to do for the rest of life. It might be, but you're definitely going to iterate and change. And you got simple sophistication is the next lesson that you have. But then this one, I think it applies to what we're just talking about, which is control, the controllables. And then I guess you can say you, there's stuff that you cannot control at all, right? Right. There's many, many things outside of your control. And I think they become distractions. You were in a, even to the sense that you either fear them or you worry about them or what have you. But at the end of the day, you, you can only control the input. A lot of times the output is uncontrollable. It's un, unexpected. You're putting in your work and or your money and or your intelligence, your input into a situation. But the outcome has a lot of factors that depend on how it's going to turn out, right? And so I think to the extent that you can focus on what you are capable of controlling, which is how you spend your time, what you invest your energy in, your passion in and all that, that you have 100% control over. And I think if you just if you just strip those things down to what am I in charge of? Where in in this situation or in my life can I actually move the needle? Right. And I'm going to focus on that. Well, that at the end of the day, that's all you got is your inputs. And I think that's what that was saying. Yeah. And there's a Bible verse, Proverbs 16, one in here. It says we can make our plans, but the final outcome is in God's hands. Do you feel that we are co-creators with God? We get to design. And like you're talking here back when you were 18 years old and you plan out, I'm going to be in the major leagues. And that's your dream. But suddenly, I mean, God had something else for you. Or what's that dynamic that is happening there? Do you create it? Or of course, of course, God has ultimately <laughs> the plan. But how do you think is that relationship between you doing something and planning something and then God? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think definitely am a believer that God has a plan for your life. And I am also a believer that you have a hand in that because you 
you have been gifted with certain abilities and creative skills and things and your use of those is sort of your answer to those blessings i guess that's your way to turn around and bless or thank god and show appreciation for what you've been given so is it a co-creation yeah i think in general there's a that god has a plan for your life that maybe you none of us are really capable of understanding as it unfolds but at the same time i think if our mindset is that that's our belief system and that's our mindset that there's a bigger purpose here there's a bigger plan for my life it's not most of that is like it's not all about me i'm not 100 percent in charge I don't get to move all the chess pieces around the way that I want them. And even if I could, that probably wouldn't be a good thing that God knows better, has better, bigger plans for my life than even I could probably even imagine or come up with. And so it's that type of mindset and belief system that if you go forth with that and you're a prayerful person and you kind of spend time reflecting and, and thinking in terms of this is not about me, there's a bigger picture here and how I fit into God's overall plan, not just the plan for my life, but how do I fit into God's plan for Kelly's life or my kid's life or my business partner's life or the greater world, right? Do you start to have that mindset and think in those terms? I think God can use that. I think he can take that and and expand upon it and multiply it out but if you're more of a selfish hey i need to control this situation and you're more closed off there's less possibility with that right the god can't do as much with that because you're limiting your world so to speak i like that and in fact you're saying god cannot do so much with that and we go into the other route which is this person that is in their mid, in middle 20s, they got out of college and they say, it says, what are you going to do? Or, you know, what do you like to do? Because that, that's the next one that you have here is choose your own dreams. You have to, that's a decision. You choose something. I want to do this. Even though, like, you choose to want, you know, wanted to be a baseball player, it didn't play up. But you, ch- you chose something. And I personally, I'm 26, and I see a lot of people my age and, and even younger or a little bit older, and they'll be like, man. I know God has amazing things, and I'm, I'm just praying for it. I'm just, I'm expecting the best, but there's no plans and there's no dreams. Uh, what what will be your message for for these people that are, you know, great believers that got great intentions, sure, but they're just waiting for God to do something great? Well, there's a reason God gave you hands and feet, right? <laughs> so you got to you got to get moving, and you got to. But I mean, having a having a strong mind is one thing, and a and an ability to dream and and cast that vision but I, I think that you sort of walk into and get your hands dirty and, and and you find the blessings that way and you find some some real passions and you find some some guidance for your life in those things too while you're moving it's that whole a body at rest stays at rest a body in motion tends to stay in motion and and i think just think of that move somewhere try something and be open to what God can do with that. I think that's probably the message there. Wonderful. So then education is expensive. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Whether you pay tuition in dollars or you just make a yeah. mistake. Well, my dad shared that stuff. I share a little story in there about my dad invested in a little cattle thing or something and it all went belly up and he went to his father and that's what his father said to him is education's expensive no matter how you get it and that's true i mean most of the good lessons have some kind of pain involved with them and despite even doing what i thought was a really good job of parenting shelby is good as probably I could have done uh, leading up to her 18th birthday, you know, you're sending them out there without an owner's manual of everything that you're going to run into and every possibility. And you just know that a lot of the education that she's going to get along the way is going to have some pain involved. It's going to be a penalty fee of it's going to be a parking ticket. Hey, there's a little pain involved. Don't park there at that time. Here's your punishment, right? And there's all those you take that and you multiply that times a thousand things. That's how life teaches us. And that's to me what what life is it's sort of just this one ongoing lifetime school that we're in learning how to get better multiply become more towards our what we whatever we think is the best version of ourselves that we can possibly pursue 
And along the way of finding out what the best version of yourself is, is you make some mistakes and you step on something and you run into a wall and you have to turn around and go the other way. And all of those little things are just the price you pay for the education so that you can not make that mistake again and you can move forward. You're, you're wearing an LSU shirt right now, which I love. And go, go Tigers. Tigers. Exactly. There you go. They play exactly. today. They play pretty soon. Yeah. Yes. So. so, and, and, um, I'm excited, but I'd love to hear your thoughts in, in the school system or educational college in the entrepreneurial world. We've seen in Silicon Valley that these kiddos just drop out of school and then suddenly they got this amazing company. So now the culture is kind of like pushing, hey, yeah, you, you don't know. need college or whatever, right. but I'm, I'm still in college. I graduate right. next semester. But right. what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, there's, and this is true in the professional world, there is formal education and training that takes place in a organized setting that's structured and it's a, a way that our brains are uh, organized to learn and, and it's necessary because there there is base level of information and, and pretty, pretty common things that we need to experience and learn. And then there's there's what I would just call life school and life school is what happens to you outside of that classroom and you can't really say this one's important and that one's not important it's like they coexist they have to coexist together because if you think about even go back to your basics of of reading and writing you probably had to learn another language at some point it's like right how do you how do you do that well you there's a formal piece of that there's the x's and o's of that but then where you've really learned some of your language is just in talking to other people that speak this language. Right? Yeah, especially here in the South. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> That's right. With well, your language. <laughs> That's right. You had, to, you had to learn twists and turns of the language. Yeah. yeah so, uh, so that's a good example, right? It's like there's textbook English, and then there's how do people talk out here in the real world, right? Uh, so that's that's a good one, but yeah, for yeah. sure. I'm going to just uh, fast forward this. If you guys want to yeah. check this out, you'll have to be a VIP member of, yeah, well, of, of Pete Bush Group yeah, just to read go. this. Well, I could see I don't know what you where you post things, but I can send it to you, and you can post yeah, it. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely, we, we can add in the show notes so you guys take a look. But we got Choose Your Own Dreams, You Are, The Competition, Forgiveness is, is your give, and then the the big three, and we can touch that one right here. The big three. So we got. Let's see, you want to go through this? Oh big yeah, three? yeah, sure. So, talk about the big three or the three main factors that will determine the course your life takes. And the first one is, and we all know this and intuitively by now, is who do you choose to hang out with? And I I always talk to my kids about who are the top five people in your life at any given moment have more influence on you than than you ever imagined and that's always going to be true whether you're 75 or 15 or 25 but the five people change right hang out with the same five people when you're in your 20s that you hung out with in high school and so forth as you go along those those five always change and you just got to you got to know that some people are going to sneak into that five that probably shouldn't be there for very long and it's just, and I mean, and you're going to, they're either going to change or you're going to uh, attract somebody into your life that maybe has some drama or negative, something that you shouldn't be spending a lot of time with. And it's, it's more, don't be wrong very long with that. Really think through like what the impact these people are having on me. So the top five in your life, because they, you end up behaving like them, you end up thinking like them, they guide your thoughts and your conversations and mindsets and things like that. So it's very, very crucial. The second thing, how do you process failure or setback? And again, we just actually spent some time talking about that, right? All the mistakes and the education you pay. If you fail, a negative person looks at that as, oh, okay, well, I'm not good at that or I shouldn't do that or whatever. The positive person looks at that and says, okay, what is that trying to teach me? I, I stepped on my toe or stubbed my toe there, but what I need to learn from that? And now I'm going to go back in there with, armed with that new knowledge and I'm going to blow through that, that ceiling, whatever it was. So I think if, if you're a person that can see failure as school and not as a setback or as a negative experience, it's a positive experience, those are your people that typically become successful because they're not hindered by, they, they process it differently. And not ever, by the way, as you notice, not everybody can do that, which is why 
it means something to be successful because very few people can actually do that. And the last thing I said was just keep the, the big three was keep your family close. They know the history they know your history. They, they love you unconditionally. They know you better than anybody else. Many people are going to come back in, in and out of your life, but your family is always there. And that was my way of saying, we're always here for you. You go out and try whatever you want, take the risks that you want. If it doesn't work out, you can always come back here and we'll we'll rebuild, we'll start over, we'll do whatever. But that's my way of giving her some encouragement to say, yeah, I'm going to go out there and do my thing because I, I always have this little bit of a safety net within my family. Yeah. I'm curious about your, uh, your personal circle, your five. Is that a combination between in your spiritual friend, the guy that you go, you just said a minute ago, you go work out in the morning yeah. with a friend, you right. follow him. So maybe that's the, the health type yeah, of guy. Yeah. And then sure, maybe yeah. the other one is the entrepreneur. Is that yeah. kind of like why? Because I feel sometimes that my entrepreneur friend, he's not necessarily talking about what he learned in church last week. Right. And right. then my church friend is not, you know, he's far away from entrepreneurship right right but how do you how's your your circle? yeah they certainly can all represent something different from you i think it's just how where where your life is so it's it's at work your life's at work your life's in your family it's in your friendships it's in your spiritual life in terms of who you end up attracting and or being attracted to in those settings is just who you spend the most time with and if you kind of catch yourself getting off the rails with a certain relationship now you're finding yourself in hanging out in different spots and you hang out with or we're doing different things or thinking different things you really got to stop and question like is this a productive relationship or is this a non-productive relationship so uh, uh, as they always say you, you can You can't pick your family to some degree, but when you're talking about spouses, if you're a single person or you love interest relationships and those kind of things, I think the relationship either adds or it detracts. I guess that's a good way to say it. And you want relationships around you that accrete energy, positivity, all the good things in life. I want to shout out to Todd Barlow. Uh, he's yeah. probably one of your closest. Yeah, Todd Barlow's <laughs> in my circle, man. I don't see him enough. I mean, that's the downside of being running a, a business and having a busy family life with kids and sports and things like that. Is and, and then all your friends are like that too, right? So you have to work hard to stay connected to to people like Todd Barlow, who's a who's an awesome person. Sure. My last two questions before we jump into the next segment of the show, it's uh, about growth. So, of course, the show Exponential Growth. And in the finance industry, you guys have the compounding mm -hmm. interest and all of that good stuff. So in your personal life, what do you think is that thing that allowed you to grow exponentially in the past couple of years? I know it's, it's maybe a hard one to write yeah. out of there, but... Well, I mean, I guess the main component or ingredient of being able to grow exponentially is to actually have this picture in your head of what it is you're trying to grow to. Right. It's the vision side of it, because I think otherwise you're yeah, I mean, when I was in college, I was playing baseball for Skip Bertman. He he threw out the analogy one time. He says, well, he told the story. He's like, hey, you're watching a basketball game on TV and there's players on the court and they dribble down to one side, but nobody shoots. It's like then the ball turns over and it comes back this way. Nobody shoots and they go by that way and it just goes back and forth like that. Nobody's taking a shot. And then you realize like neither side has a has a goal on it. The basketball goal is missing on both sides of the court. And he talked about just kind of you just dribble around. If there's nothing to shoot at, then what is the goal? What is the thing? And he used that as the analogy for us to say, you got to have goals, right? And that picture has always stuck in my head since I was 18 years old, right? And so I think the main ingredients for exponential success is to be able to have a picture. If you're the entrepreneur, everyone you surround yourself with is looking to you to take this picture that's in your head and make it tangible to them. Because the second component is you better build a great team around you of people that can complement your unique abilities with theirs. Because you, you, we're all only good at a few things. You're really good, unique at a few things. And so you need to build the team around you to be able to execute the plan. But they're usually not the type of people that can see something that is not real yet. Whereas an entrepreneur usually has an ability to go, meaning, what is the quote? To, to do the impossible, you have to see the invisible, right? And an entrepreneur can see the invisible thing and other people can't. So you have to make it, take it from being invisible and, and sort of this thought in your head and put it out onto paper and or a plan and whatever. And then those people can see that 
because now it's tangible and they can take it and execute the steps. But to me, those are the big two. There's probably a lot of factors in exponential growth, but those are probably the big two. Wonderful. And the last one, just to close uh, on this one. So, of course, we will know about Dave Ramsey and how much mm -hmm. of a positive impact in personal finances. Mm -hmm. But lately, we've been uh, studying this guy that his mission is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. <laughs> because mm. apparently, you know, I love that because there's mm -hmm. all of these entrepreneurs saying, no, we just got to reinvest all this money to grow the business. And they're making die. They're, they're right. just like paying their bills and eating. Like, right. <laughs> it's just, it's nuts. But right. you being a financial person, what will it be that advice to exponential growth in, in, in a personal finances level or a business or entrepreneurial finance level, I would say. Yeah. And I mean, Craig could probably echo this. And I think anybody that's ever invested in a company or an idea would be able to say the same thing. And that is that money alone very rarely will lead to a compound exponential type growth of anything right? Investing capital into just whatever infrastructure, business, whatever. The main thing that gets exponential growth is an investment in a person, an investment in people and their capabilities. And so to the extent that you're going in and looking at a business opportunity, I'm telling you, I'm the same way. And I know Craig's the same way is, is you're actually not so much looking at the concept, the idea, the actual, what is it and what does it do? as you are looking at that person and you're looking at that person's passion and their and their capabilities and the kind of their grit like are they going to stick it out when it gets tough are they are they going to realize that they're not good at everything and surround themselves with other really good people and invest in that those are the types of things you you look for when you're if you're kind of a private equity investor or a, a angel investor is like you're looking at that that person and their purpose and their passion for what they're doing so from a finance standpoint, you could say, well, should you invest in an equipment and should you invest in stocks and bonds and da, da, da. I think most people go, I'm going to invest in that person. And that if it's the right kind of person, they'll figure out what to invest that in. Right. This is, so it's, it's at that level, it's a secondary investment level, but it's the investment in the person that's running the company or the leadership team of the company. Is that kind of what you were looking for? Totally, there? 100%. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I really appreciate this. And now Craig LeBlanc is taking over the next segment. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'd like to jump right in. I've got a few questions just off okay. of what you said. Perfect. Um, I focus a lot on mentorship because, mm -hmm. of course, Legacy is a mentorship program right. that works with young entrepreneurs trying to connect them to guys like yourself. Sure. And we did this when we brought some to your house, but we know it's much more effective with podcasts. We can share your story your wisdom with the world. And so that's what we're trying to do. And Pete, you're one of the most legacy minded men that I think I've ever interviewed, especially when it comes to family and, and community as well. But maybe tell us why do you do that? First of all, I feel very fortunate. And I, for whatever reason, have always, and I say always, that's probably not true, but I would say by the time I was a uh, mid teen, let's call it, I had this awareness that a lot of what I was getting able to being able to do, a lot of the things I was able to be involved in, somebody else was providing. Somebody else was either paying for, putting together, organizing, or what have you. And it was sort of this this respect and this humility of I'm swinging. Now these days, everybody you know has their own baseball bats, but back in the day, growing up, you know, it's like I wouldn't have had a baseball bat unless some father or some coach or some school or somebody bought that bat for me to hit with and that glove for me to play with because we grew up without a lot of resources to be able to do our own stuff so I think it was a awareness there I always sought out mentors I always sought out advice from people that were kind of ahead of me I felt like that was the best way to learn is like look at people that were a few years ahead of me and see what sort of mistakes they made and then just being a um, spiritually minded grateful person like we talked about earlier with with Gabe in that it's not all about me this is not all about me I'm on a journey and I'm going to try to do the best I can while I'm here in this short little window of time and try to leave leave everything that that I touch a little bit better than when I found it Zig Ziglar says that uh, most powerful human emotion is gratitude and so it seems as if you're really from a young age were grateful 
and you're somewhat paying that forward by investing in others. Is that true? Absolutely. I, I think you take something like gratitude and you, and you multiply it. I mean, the good that that can do in the world is is amazing. And and you, I think there's lots of things going on today that multiply a, a lot of the bad stuff. But you look at people talk about the downsides of the internet and things like that. I mean, it just speeds up and multiplies everything and people tend to focus on the bad stuff that it can you take like this podcast for instance i mean you can take that and you multiply the number of people that are touched by it that's sort of the good of uh, multiplication so a lot of this show we talk about the milk and not not that we're focusing on the negative but i really believe that there's a practical side uh, that comes with handling the manure. And when it comes to mentoring others, tell us a little bit about the manure that comes out the other end when you're trying to help grow people. Well, I think some of the feedback you get is not always appreciative, depending on where people are in their life. And again, what you're putting in, I think you can have a perspective that you're taking the right approach, doing the right thing, investing in that person. But what the receiving end of it is the perception of it's different. Somebody might look at you and say, well, he's just doing that because he wants this out of me, or he wouldn't be doing that if it didn't do something for him. And I think that's a mindset of a person that you could take the same exact approach with a person that is very receptive and humble and grateful for the wisdom and information you're trying to pass along to them or help you're trying to give them or whatever. And you could do the same exact thing and it just has a different effect. So I think some of the manure is if I'm looking back to uh, times when I've either given or tried to coach or mentor somebody, either my approach wasn't a fit for them or they weren't a fit for me or my style or what have you. And uh, or maybe it just didn't move fast enough, and there's all kind of variables that go into play with that. But when things don't work out, that to me is always an opportunity for me to sit back and go, gosh, what what could I have done to make that better? And in some, or made that work out at all. And we we go through this process where it's kind of a post-mortem process in business where it's stuff, something doesn't work out. Well, you got to go do a post-mortem. We've had to do a couple recently where it's just like that. We should have gotten that to work out and it didn't. What happened? And at the end of the day, you may, you may get to the end of that thought process and you may just say, what, it didn't work out at the end of the day because of X and we didn't have any control over X. So... We're just going to have to tip our hat. I call it the slider on the black. That's the old baseball phrase. The home plate is white, except it has a black outing, outer lining to it. I don't know if you look at a home plate and look at one on TV next time. It's white, but it's not all white. It has this little black strip on it, right? And the slider on the black, a slider is a ball that comes in and then darts away from a hitter or darts into a hitter, depending on what side of the plate they're batting from. But it, let's say it crosses the plate and it doesn't get much of the plate, but it just crosses that black edge, right? And we call that, you tip your hat, the pitcher threw a good pitch, he got you on that one. It barely, barely was a strike by a centimeter, an umpire called you out on it. You tip your hat and you go get them next time. I think there's a lot of that in life. And I, we, I tend to refer to that as the slider on the black. It's just the one, man, you, you probably couldn't even hit it if you tried. <laughs> right, right. There are in our show, it's geared a lot towards young entrepreneurs and, and the youth, but there's a growing audience of uh, soon-to-be future mentors and, and mentors themselves really stepping into that role of, okay, I need to be a mentor. Maybe I'm inspired by this show to be a mentor. What are some of the skill sets as a mentor that you feel like are important, like magnanimity, understanding, patience? Maybe expound a little bit on those. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you, you get, you're going to get opportunities to mentor. I think almost everybody gets some opportunity to mentor. I mean, if you have a kid, if you have a child, yeah. you get an opportunity <laughs> to mentor, right? Hourly. <laughs> Craig's had a lot of opportunity to mentor. <laughs> um, but you, you, anytime you're in a situation like that where someone is turning their eyes to you and going, what should I do or give me some advice or come to help me, then – I think it takes some humility on your part to to basically sit there and go, okay, well, I have this perspective that I'm no different than anybody else. I'm not that special, and yet I'm one of a kind. So there's this balance between that and the humility of that is that, okay, I'm, I've, uh, in many ways, I'm just like anybody else, but 
I've had this special set of circumstances, this special, uh, my little bookends of life. I've had all this stuff that's gone on there. And if that can be useful to someone to learn and or improve their life or make progress or whatever, then having the humility to share that without being arrogant about it. I think arrogance comes in and some, you see bravados, a lot of it on TV these days, right? Just this bravado, like, man, I got it all figured out. I think if you're a mentor, you better go in and say, listen, I'm sitting here talking to you about what I know. There's a lot of stuff I don't know. And you tend to give away what you need the most, right? So to me, the best way to become a mentor is to seek out a mentor, right? Because you, you, I have other, I, you were talking about the top five earlier. I mean, I have mentors in different areas of my life, right? Some are in business, some are in spiritual, some are in health and fitness, da, da, da. You know, you get these different mentors around you and then you tend to, the experience you get from that is so positive that you want to turn around and go, well, you know, sure. When somebody asked me, how did, how did you do that? What did you do? man, I'm, I'm going to pay it forward. I'm going to help this guy because then he'll help another guy and there'll be this long chain of good that multiplies out of that. So it, like I said, it's, it's being confident that you have experienced something worthwhile and useful to share, but at the same time, this humility that, look, man, I, there's some things I know and some things I don't know. I mean, I'm just going to tell you how I've experienced it and what I've done and have confidence that that worked for me. If you can find little nuggets of truth in that that work for you, that's awesome. But I can't, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you I got it all figured out, right. that type of thing. So for me in the past, when I've, when I've coached, and I'm, I know you've coached a lot of teams and helped the young players. And so when I was back at Catholic High School coaching Javelin, uh, you know, I jumped in there kind of like Leonidas with the Spartans going against the Persians. We're going to be on the front line with them. And I throw with them and try not to pull a shoulder or anything. And... Of course, you, you critique and you, and you film and you go over drills. And I noticed that every one of my throwers, I had about uh, 10 of them at the time, they all had the same mistake. And it was right on that last impulse step before you throw. And we could not get rid of that mistake for months. We worked on it. And it just seemed to keep coming back and coming back. And we even watched highlight films of Olympic throwers and world record holders and filmed them. And it was when we decided to film ourselves... And, of course, I'm in there throwing with him that Cal, our best thrower, points out. He says, Craig, I think I figured out why we make that mistake. <laughs> and it was because no matter how much I told him and showed him from other people to do, I had that mistake uh, in my right. throat. Yeah. And subconsciously, they were imitating me. Right. And so the question I want to ask is how important is it not just to, to tell others what to do, but to live it and to see you live out yeah. an example? Oh, it's, I mean, that's where the rubber meets the road. I mean, talk is cheap, right? Uh, and people see through that. So if you're, if you're saying one thing and doing another, in essence, you're, you're being deceitful to yourself, first of all, but then you're being deceitful to everybody that you're talking to because it's, it's that thing that never made sense to me. It's like, do what I say, not what I do. You know, the parent type thing. My parents weren't like that. I'm sure your parents weren't like that, but some parents are like, don't watch me. Just do what I tell you to do. It's tough. It's tough because every species pretty much models their mentors, their parents, and they're the first mentors you have. And you just, you model it because you're like, if you're a duck, well, you waddle along and you do what mama duck does. Right. And I think that that's, that's why it's, it's crucial to be authentic and not say one thing and do another but authentically just say hey this is who i am and by the way it's not all good you pick up bad habits you take the wrong step you because no person is perfect and you just have to have confidence that i'm good at a lot of things i'm terrible at a lot of things but my intentions are to be authentic and let you experience you know that so in in every walk in life uh, whether it be selfish or selfless you're going to shovel manure whichever road you take <laughs> right and whether you choose the selfish path of looking out for yourself or the selfless path of looking out for others, maybe help. Why don't you give us a case, build the case as to why you would encourage people to choose to serve others, even though up front it looks like it's not the right decision? Yeah, that, that's actually a great question. And I think where I would start with that is to say that to deny that that you have selfish interest, anybody, right? Uh, in our 
industry, there's this huge movement that's been going on a long time, but it's even bigger now about disclosing potential conflicts of interest and things like that. Like clients need to know if there's some conflict there that I don't see right up front. But I think in terms of choosing a selfless serve others path or selfish path, it's not a one or the other. It's I think that you can look at a lot of good people that have done great things that have served a lot of other people and helped others and in it, most entrepreneurial efforts are like that right because they they end up if they become successful for instance impression works if it becomes successful man it does a lot of good for a lot of things but down there at the root of that thing is somebody one person has an idea and they're like man that's a great idea i would love to see that come to fruition because of all the good but it but the motivation is sort of this self-interest like i see myself doing that i'm in that picture it's not a mutually exclusive i just do this mother Teresa style for others there is this self-interest that that is actually the good type of self-interest i think when you get to very selfish behaviors that are over the top like it and it's like you said apparent like the guy's just in it for himself. We all know people like that, right? Or situations like that. It's pretty obvious the guy doesn't really care about it. He only cares about himself. Those are the ones that are offensive to us. But there's this good selfishness. There's this good self-interest that is that ends up blossoming into a, a, a flower, into a garden that feeds a lot of people. And I think that is what I would say about that's the thing to do is, is the mindset has to be, I want to build an awesome garden that feeds a lot of people. But I see myself in there. I see myself in that garden. So selfishness is thought to be bad, I think. But I think if you're guiding it towards help of others, then I think it's a good thing. Right. I see that as well a lot in entrepreneurship. They, they look for the win-win yeah. in, the, in all situations. That yeah. Way. It's, and, and people point to them and go, well, you know, you, you're, well, yeah, you want to do that because you have all this. You have this type of lifestyle, whatever. Like, yeah, I do. And that pales in comparison to what everyone else benefits from this. And I, I think that's that's the bigger picture to see is that which one of those is the biggest when you get your business built? Is it that it's just doing more for you than everybody else or vice versa? And you always have to go into this mind with this mindset like I want to help people. I want to help as many people as I can. My team, their families, the clients, their families, and on and on and on and multiply that out. I think there was a... Uh... This might have been made into some country song or whatever, but it was about how you know, help others and they'll be ungrateful, but help others anyway. Or Yeah, I know what song you're talking about. Do I, it anyway. Yeah, yeah it's right. Anyway. Yeah. And, and towards the end of the song, it's like it wasn't for them anyway. But something I've observed about that is even when you help others and they're ungrateful and let's say it no, doesn't work out and you, you invest in what was a win-win up front, I notice it does make a great person out of you that sometimes the best product that came out of that losing situation was that you became a much better person because you invested in others. So tell us about what giving has made you into and why that's been beneficial to the mentor. He's got great questions. <laughs> um, I think giving, giving has made me a better giver. Like I always say, you give, give away what you desire most. And so we talk about selfishness a minute ago. Think, think in terms of this, like I want to be known as a great giver. That's a selfish thought. Like I want my reputation to be a great giver. That's a selfish thought. But the only way to get that is I got to be a great giver. And I got, and a lot of people have to benefit from that, right? That's a good example of what we are talking about earlier. I would say that giving makes also makes you, it, can, it adds to your humility. In the sense that a lot of times when you are giving to a situation, what it took to give to that situation was a a recognition on your part that that's somebody that needs something that I have. Like like they they're struggling and or there's a problem there and I actually have the ability to move the needle just a little bit in my world. I can touch that a little bit and make it more positive for them or I can donate money or I could do whatever I can volunteer And that takes a humility on your part. Not that the person's beneath you. It's just that they have an issue. They have a concern that, man, and I've got been blessed with the skills or resources to help with. Well, I need to do that. So I think it it can make you more humble to be a giver, too. Well, man, thank you so much, Pete. This has been uh, a great great podcast. I've enjoyed it. 
Guys, I would encourage you, uh, surround yourself by givers. Surround yourself by, by men like Pete. Thank you. And uh, you will definitely succeed in life. And even if you don't, you'll be at least happy at the end of life. <laughs> That's right. There you go. But fantastic. Good Thank show. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it.